<clears throat> Again, I should be recording. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about how populations fluctuate. It is not Mar April. It's there we go. We got this. Okay, so lynx are a very large, small cat. They are classed as a small cat, but it is not a small cat you would want to try to pet because they take your face off. Um, this is like a 35 or 40 pound cat. Lives in the northern parts of Canada and chases down whatever it darn well pleases that's smaller than it and kills it. And one of their primary food sources, one of the primary prey species that they eat are snowshoe hares. So snowshoe hares are a rabbit species. They change color in the winter, which is kind of cool. They, they have a white winter coat and a brown summer coat. They're, you know, a great example of evolving to fit your environment. And this was a very classic study that was done, taking data and putting together population size data on two different species that are connected. Now here's the thing. Look closely at the years on that. 1850 to 1925, and I want to say that this was put together in the 40s or 50s. How do you get population data that's 100 years old? So, okay, if you want to go out and sample, we talked about sampling mobile species. You can set nets for walleye. You could go out and you could put up trail cams, which they didn't have in 1850, by the way. Um, you know, you could go out and put cameras up in the woods. You could do all kinds of things. But how do you get 100-year-old data? Where do you find data like that? This is the whole part of, like, science is creative. Well, and that's a good, that's a good thought, but that's not long enough to make fossils. Hunting. Hunting records. Do people keep good records of what they hunt? You might. Population now. Huh? Population now. Well, no, this is actual data from the 1850s, 60s, 70s. It's not just projections. Let's go down that road with hunting. You ever do something, like, have you ever mowed lawns for money or watched kids for money or done some job? Do you tend to keep pretty good track if you're being paid? Uh, yeah, if I'm delivering newspapers and I'm getting paid per newspaper, I can tell you exactly how many newspapers I delivered because I don't want to get cheated. In Canada, in the 1850s, do you think there was anybody who was getting paid for pelts? Uh-huh. French-Canadian fur trappers? Um, the people who ended up becoming Canadians, I guess at that point, they were just French fur trappers traveling North America. Um, the, whatever, I don't know if it was the Canadian Fur Company, kept really meticulous records about the number of pelts that were purchased in each of these years. So if you go back, if you go back and look at those records, is it an exact count of the number of lynxes or snowshoe hares that were there? No. Should it reflect the general trend that some years we have more, some years we have less? Yeah, because in years when the population is lower, trappers are going to get fewer pelts, and the pelt numbers are going to reflect that. So these, these aren't exact numbers, but they're pretty reflective. And here's the weird part. Here's what we see. We'll have a spike in the lynx population. Lynx population goes up. Guess what happens to the rabbit population? It goes down. More predators means more prey animals die. Well, the following year, because the lynx have eaten a lot of rabbits, lynx populations will drop. When lynx population drops, guess what happens to the rabbit population? It increases because you have fewer predators. A couple years of high rabbit populations give you more lynxes. Once you have more lynxes, lynxes, lynx? I'm not sure what the plural of lynx is. Lynx eye? Once you have more lynx eye, I'm just going to go with that because I like the way it sounds, um, you tend to have fewer rabbits. So we see these kind of fluctuations in nature. But here's the other question that I think begs to be asked then. Why was 1860 such a darn good year? For rabbits, I mean, they're estimating that there were close to 160,000 snowshoe hares in that year. Why was that year so awesome, and the year before it and the year after it not so much? What are possible factors that could change year to year that might... So we had a low lynx population, but could there be factors independent of lynx populations that would drive changes in the rabbit population? 
There could be disease. There could be a drought. There could be, you know, for a year when we had a great big rabbit population, maybe they had a really mild winter. Maybe they had abundant food for the rabbits. We, we don't know, and it, we can't go back and reconstruct that from this kind of data set, but we can see population fluctuations due to just changes in the environment. We can't capture all of them. You know, we've talked about things like bumper years of acorns mean what for Lyme disease cases? Higher, because a bumper crop of acorns means a bumper crop of what? Mice. And a bumper crop of mice means more ticks get infected, a bumper crop of ticks, and then we translate that a couple years down the road to higher Lyme disease cases. So we have these changes in the environment that we can't always completely pin down or track, but they cause changes in population size. This is, this is kind of a classic study. It's one that gets quoted a lot. So what happens when you have a population that drops due to whatever? Drought, a shortage of food, an abundance of predators. They call these the crying cats because if you look very closely at their face, these little tear streaks on either side are a real distinctive marking, so they get called the crying cats. And cheetahs, we've talked about them before. Cheetos. Cheetahs, not Cheetos, Cheetahs. Um, went through a genetic bottleneck about 10,000 years ago. Genetic bottleneck. It was about oh ten thousand years ago. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna finish that tomorrow and start to talk about human population growth. Um, finish getting the slide from the YouTube video because you can pause it that way.